y'all, right quick, let me tell you something. When I went to New York that time and we went through Spanish Harlem, wasn't nothing Spanish about that Harlem. Child, nothing, nothing. Gentrification got y'all in this rich too. Hello there, Bellas. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com for these Mick shades in red. We have them coming in black, tortoise, and I think another color. We also have these headbands coming in. They are like... Anyway, just go on over there and check it out. And if you are not already a part of this book club, please hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on the YouTube. And for a small monthly fee of $5, you babies, yes, you can be privy to all the shenanigans before the YouTube gets it if the YouTube gets it. Now, let's talk about... Yes, the next book. Be My Baby. How I Survived Mascara, Miniskirts, and Madness. Or My Life as a Fabulous Ronette. Skinny Yellow Horse. That was the name the black kids had for me when I was growing up. Because I had light skin and I was so small that I'd always kick like a little pony whenever I got into a fight. And I was always getting beat up. P.S. 153 on 145th Street and Amsterdam Avenue was one of the toughest black schools in Harlem. And the kids were always making fun of me. Hey, half-breed, they yell, get your ass back to the reservation. I didn't have it as bad as my sister. I was a tomboy and I could run fast, but Estelle was always so poised and proper that the kids at PS 153 thought she was a snob. So they'd pick on her worse than me. Even though Estelle was two years older than I was, there were times when I had to defend her against some of those kids. Yeah, because them damn baby girls be off the chain. They ain't never scared of a fight. There's something wrong with my younger siblings. It is. I, I think I don't know. I think their brain is fucked up. The worst thing about all of it was that I never even understood prejudice until I got to school. I was born in Spanish Harlem on August 10th, 1943. She's a Leo. My mother, Beatrice Bennett, is black and Cherokee. And my father, Louis, was white, which makes me a half-breed. My sister Estelle and I were raised on 151st Street between Amsterdam and Broadway in a neighborhood that had Chinese laundries, Spanish restaurants, and black grocery stores. We saw people of every color on the street, black, white, and yellow, with eyes that slanted this way and that. A lot of the kids on our block were half-breeds. So interracial marriage seemed normal to us. But the kids at PS 153 didn't agree. Estelle and I both had long straight hair and that got us into more trouble than anything else. My mother used to put my hair in these long thick braids that went all the way down my back. And then she tied bright yellow bows on the end. That was the way I had my hair the day this black girl named Barbara asked if she could touch it. I was sitting at my desk in second grade when she leaned forward from behind. Ooh, Ronnie, your hair looks so soft, she whispered. Can I feel it? Let me tell you what this bitch Barbara did. She tried it. No, she went beyond trying it because some things would have had to been done to Barbara. And I had my long braid hat on today. Some of y'all was like, nay. Where do I get this braid hat from? Girl, I bought it from Anna Sui. I'm going to put a link below to where you can purchase the hat from, right? But at any rate, uh, the little girl Barbara was like, ooh, can I see your hat? 
Ooh, let me touch it. Ooh, la la. It's so pretty. Ronnie likes sure. Go ahead. The girl Barbara took some scissors and clipped off her fucking braid. You hear me? Ronnie. Because she was mortified and, and, and not a fighter. She hollered and ran into the closet and stayed there until her mother came down to the school and coaxed her out. The little girl was mortified. How could this bitch do this to me? I've seen children do worse. I'm going to attribute that to the gross colorism of the times. Now, I'm not excusing the little girl's behavior, but it's something about light-skinned people and how they think back then or thought back then. I was probably among the darkest in my family. Me and my Aunt Crystal. And the crazy thing about it was not that my mother wasn't beautiful. My mother and my Aunt Wee Wee was beautiful. But it, it, the most beautiful of the Harris girls were my Aunt Crystal. And the most dangerous with the hands. That's mixed mama. Was Aunt Crystal. I'm going to attribute the little girl's behavior to the gross colorism of the time. Festering hate between blacks who are light-skinned and dark-skinned. I'm light-skinned, so I'm better. Just because I'm dark doesn't mean that you're bad. It just breathes all kinds of hate between blacks. I hear the same thing with Latinos. The light-skinned Latinos don't care for the dark-skinned Latinos, you know? I would actually go as far as to say it's the same thing with whites because... I feel like pure whites have a problem with Italians, Greeks, um, Jewish. I'm not white, but that's what I see. The next week, my mother signed us up at PS92 on 134th, where they had a mixture of Spanish and black kids along with a few whites. It was a better school and it was right across the street from my grandmother's house in Spanish Harlem. Oh, y'all, right quick. Let me tell you something. When I went to New York that time and we went through Spanish Harlem, wasn't nothing Spanish about that Harlem. Child, nothing, nothing. Gentrification got y'all ninjas too. Estelle and I used to play with my aunt Hermione's kids, Diane and Elaine, who were about our age. But the cousin who I was closest to was my Aunt Susu's daughter, Nadra. Nadra Tallon. Her father was a Spanish man, which made her a half-breed, like me. My grandmother was very strict with us. We weren't even supposed to go outside and play. If we wanted sunshine, we had to find it up on the roof where she could keep an eye on us. We weren't allowed out to the park because that's where strangers hung out. I was about eight years old when I convinced Nadra to sneak across the street to the candy store with me. We got there without anyone catching us and we were already chewing our licorice whips and candy corn outside the store when we noticed this Spanish guy standing in the middle of the sidewalk with his back to us. We tried to walk past him, but as we did, he turned around and showed us his pickle, which was dangling outside of his pants. We screamed so loud, they must have heard us in Queens. Then we ran home and told our grandmother and all of our aunts what had happened. They made us stay inside for a month. It was a big deal for me to want to go outside and play with the children of certain quarters. The only time that I could ever go out and play with any children they had to be going to the same private school as me. That would be Holy Redeemer. When I think about it, I didn't know any of the children in the neighborhood that did not go to Holy Redeemer. Now, I might have met them in passing. The public school in the area was Walker Jones. So whenever my cousin Honey would come over, I was allowed to go down and um, play with the neighborhood kids because Honey was there. Honey was out there. But... That was the only time that I got to interact with the kids from Walker Jones. Everyone in my family knew how much I loved to sing. So it didn't surprise any of them when I climbed up on my grandmother's coffee table at the age of four and started singing my little nonsense song. I liked it up there on that coffee table. And once I got up there, I never 
did climb down. By the time I was eight, I was already working up whole numbers for our family's little weekend shows. And when I stood up to sing, I was always the center of attention in the room. One afternoon, my uncles even surprised me with my own spotlight, which was really just an old Maxwell House can. Child, that's, that's coffee. Y'all, I don't even, do they still have Maxwell House? Because I damn sure don't see the commercials no more. Which was really just an old Maxwell House can with a little light bulb stuck in it. But I loved it. That light seemed to focus all the warmth in the room on me as I belted out Hank Williams jambalaya in my eight-year-old voice. When I finished the song, I looked out over the 25-watt bulb and saw that everyone in grandma's living room was clapping and looking at me. When it was over, I got down and sat on the rug between my sister and Nadra. That's it. I thought, that's the feeling I want for the rest of my life. Then Estelle would get up on stage and do a song or she'd join Nadra or my cousin Elaine and me in a number that we'd worked out in three-part harmony. Our mother loved to see us sing together and she encouraged our show business. The thing I remember most about those early days in Spanish Harlem is how hard my mom worked to make our life at home seem like Ozzy and Harriet. We ate every meal together and dad always had a place at the head of the table. We didn't have a lot of money, but our parents always made sure we had toys to play with and we were creative kids. If we couldn't have a dollhouse, Estelle and I would take our dolls and crawl out on the fire escape and pretend that it was their summer home. Dolls were a big thing in my life. I loved them so much. All my girl cousins bragged about how they outgrew their dolls, but I never got tired of them. I slept with dolls all the way up until I was married. Hold on, girl. Let me tell you something that she said that it was profound that I uh, never thought of before. Like, dolls allow you to dream. And if you're a child sheltered and you're always in the house because your parents don't let you outside the house, your doll babies can take you places, especially if you got the Barbie child, the Barbie or the Dana doll, the black doll. Yeah, that was my first black doll baby, Dana. And that was a shame because she was like five foot 10, big ass feet. She wasn't really five foot 10, but you know, she was like taller than Barbie. She was thicker than Barbie. Lips were bigger than Barbie. Nose was thicker than Barbie's, you know, thicker hair. It wasn't nappy, but it was, it was long. Barbie's you know? gave you an opportunity to fly, you know, where you lived in a, a special extravagant home, you know, with levels. You drove a Barbie Ferrari or Lamborghini. I think I had the Corvette or something like that, but I never realized that until I read this part in the book. My father recognized that he was basically a dreamer, so he understood how important my little fantasies were. If I was enchanted by something, he would always get it from me, no matter what it took, even if he had to steal it. Child. Which is exactly what he did one day. We were shopping at the Woolworths at 145th Street and Broadway. And Dad had just finished loading our basket with all the household items when I saw a tiny pair of ice skates on a shelf in the toy aisle. They were miniature skates, the perfect size for one of my favorite dolls. They were so beautiful. I reached up to the shelf and pulled them down so I could hold them in my hands. When my father saw me, he walked over and laid his hand on my shoulder. I'm sorry, Butchie, he told me. That was his favorite nickname for me. We don't have money for doll skates today. Oh, daddy, I begged, please. I wasn't about to give in. And finally, I made such a fuss that the security guards walked over to see what was going on. She over there throwing a tantrum in the doll baby aisle. She's stomping. I want it, I want it, I want it. father like, you can't get it. I ain't got no money today. But Ronnie know, daddy, you a thief. You be thieving. Still this like you do everything else to daddy. She throwing her a little fit. Security come over. Hey, what's the problem? The father's like, okay, okay. My daughter's having a fit. 
because she can't get what she wants. Oh, okay, I get it, I get it. Finally, the father and Ronnie make it to the cash register. They pay for everything. As soon as they get out of the store, daddy opened up his hands and go, ta-da! Don't you ever doubt your daddy, girl! Ronnie like, I love you, daddy. Mm. My doll skates, I shrieked. Thank you, daddy. Thank you, you little devilish bitch, you. You know your father is a damn thief. You know he'll steal the wine from Jesus. Girl, doll skates, I shrieked. Thank you, daddy. Thank you. Now, don't tell your mother how I got those, he cautioned. That should be our little secret. Of course, I knew they were stolen. I know you knew it, Ronnie. Bushy, I know you knew it. That's why you threw a fit. Because you in there like daddy, you steal every goddamn thing else. You can't steal these doll baby skates for me. <laughs> of course, I knew they were stolen. My father had actually slipped them into his back pocket while he was talking to security. But I didn't care. All I knew was that I wanted those skates in the worst way. And my daddy got them for me. And Stella and I thought we had the best dad in the world. He always seemed so happy, go lucky, and easy going. Not like our mom, who was always strict and stern. We never could figure out why she got so short tempered around dad. We didn't understand that he had a drinking problem that was getting worse every year. And all we knew was that mom and dad didn't always get along as well as they should. Mm -hmm. Cause mama probably around there making sure the bills get paid. That would make anybody angry. I'm around here paying all the damn bills and this nigga around here just drinking and stealing. There wasn't any one time I can point to and say that's the day my family fell apart. My mom and dad finally split up when I was 12. But even that was a long time coming. My sister and I never saw them argue, but we caught enough cross looks exchanged across the dinner table to know that things weren't all that great. And every so often, we'd hear harsh words spoken in whispers after they thought we'd gone to sleep. Dad's real test came when Mom decided to move to a bigger apartment. She was fed up with our tiny walk-up on 151st Street. So she went out and found a brand new two-bedroom place at 405 West 149th Street. The rent was $140 a month which was a lot to pay in 1956. But with her waitressing money and dad's income, she figured we could just about make it so long as dad kept himself together. 